way to start the night. Uh, yeah, I yeah. think you might gather that we like you. Yeah, and we thanks. appreciate your work like a great you, deal. Yeah. <laughs> so, first, a couple of questions about this film. Um, when did you first hear Chet Baker play? Well, um, I was the perfect age when Let's Get Lost came out. It's a Bruce Weber made a documentary about Chet Baker. I'd never heard of Chet Baker. Um, and, but I kept hearing this documentary was good and it was shot in black and white and it seemed kind of interesting. And it came at a moment when jazz was resurfacing in film when I was falling in love with film and, and Clint Eastwood made Bird and there was Round Midnight uh, and Let's Get Lost all coming out around the same time it, that gave me a shot of what jazz music could be. And while his music isn't that amazing in Let's Get Lost. I mean, what's, what's amazing about Let's Get Lost is kind of how, what a shadow of a person he had become. I went back and started listening to some records and I really fell in love with it. And for people who are just starting to know jazz, Chet is a very easy in. Um, he's very talented and, you know, part of the bebop scene. He played with Charlie Parker, but he's, he always was interested in melody in a way that a lot of them weren't. And so it's, it's readily available to an, er, a new listener. And so I loved it, but that was that. And then a, this is kind of an interesting story is that a few years later I'd made Before Sunrise and some things, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks. But so I became friends with Richard Linkletter, who and Richard Linkletter's got this amazing mind. And I get this call from my agent saying, Brad Pitt's dropped out of a Chet Baker biopic. This is, this is literally, I'm, I'm about 28 years old or something. Brad Pitt's dropped out of a Chet Baker biopic. They want to know if you want to be in it. And I was like, uh, hold on a second. And I called Richard Linkletter. And um, I said, well, what, what do you think? Is that a good idea or a bad idea? And he said, well, I remember this exactly because it really shows you how an amazing person's mind works. He goes, well, what's interesting about Chet Baker? Chet Baker is cool. What does cool mean? Cool is detached. It's detached. You can't tell if he cares or he doesn't care, even when he's singing. Does he care a lot? Does he care nothing? It's, it's, it's a movie about detachment. It's a movie about the 50s when America lost its grace. It's a movie about how America stopped being detached because there's detachment is, is a Zen enlightenment thing and it's also a, a, a deal about not caring. And we went from the, he, Chet Baker saw the William Claxton photos and believed his own hype and yeah, I know it. It's a day in the life of Chet Baker the day before he chides heroin and starts to believe his own hype. And, and I was like, Okay, let's do this together. That sounds awesome. <laughs> and so we started coming up with a script that was a day in the life of Chet Baker um, around 25. We were pushing it a little bit, but that he was already successful, but he hadn't tried heroin yet. And that um, in, in that course of this film, he gets the William Claxton photo shoots happen. He's done the photo shoot, but he sees the proofs. And Rick had this great idea of a scene of him just looking at how photogenic he is and noticing for the first time. And like, wow, I look cool, you know? And, you know, and, and, and so you slowly get the sense of this looming drug addiction is in the background and waiting for him. And he, Rick was also trying to say something about where America was at that moment. And so that was very interesting. And I worked hard on the script. Uh, we did it with Stephen Belber, but we saw a lot of jazz and I read everything about Chet. And, I, and the movie never got made. We never got the money to make it. And it was really heartbreaking. Um, in fact, one day I was visiting Rick, talking about it. It was just the most, you have to understand, we're really good friends. And so this is kind of a hard conversation to have. And it's a beautiful day. We've had a nice time. We're talking. I said, when the, when the hell are we gonna get the money to make that movie? And Rick goes, you know, Chet was a junkie by 24, 25. I'm like, yeah, he goes, you're 32. <laughs> I'm like, you're saying I'm too old? He goes, I'm saying you're too old. I was like, damn, you're my friend. And he's like, it's not me, man, it's time. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, all right. So that one just went to think. So cut to 15 years later, I get this script. <laughs> Um, 
I, I get this script of Chet Baker in his 40s. Ha ha, I think. <laughs> uh, you know? And, uh, and, um, and it was so interesting because I felt like, you know how the movie starts with the movie within the movie that was supposed to be about the 50s? Well, in my mind's eye, that was the original movie, you know, like I, I was, because Rick wanted to shoot it in black and white, and it was gonna be like Robert Frank's Pull My Daisy, for those of you that know that film, and, and, and it, it felt like I'd, it felt like I was doing a sequel, you know? <laughs> a sequel to a film that hadn't been made, and so I, I, I got to revisit, I felt personally his failings, because I, you know, and you also, anybody who has early success understands a certain dilemma that poses immediately. I mean, the, you're sitting there so happy Dead Poets Society is a big hit, and you don't know that it like, doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> and it leaves you on a strange ground to walk with the, how to judge your own development hmm. the rest of your life. You know, because all the superficial things don't really make sense, because I have to be better than I was then, but I remember Norman Lloyd, so all you have to do is ask one question, and I'll just talk all night. Um, I remember, <laughs> just because I'm nervous. Um, uh, uh, Norman Lloyd was one of um, Orson Welles' members of Mercury Theatre Company, an amazing actor, and he'd been in you know, a trillion amazing things. And he also had a part in Dead Poets Society when I was 17, 18, just starting out. And I was, I was doing this thing where... One of the other, we were doing a shot, we were walking down the halls, and I was just goofing around and I would kick the guy in front of me's foot, so he'd trip and he'd spill all his books, you know? And it was making the other guys laugh. And we were friends, I wasn't being mean, he wasn't crippled or anything, I wasn't being, you know. Uh, you guys all got so serious, like, wow, I didn't know he was, I was 17 and he was my friend and I kicked his foot. And Norman Lloyd came over to me and he said, hey, let me talk to you. I said, yeah, he goes, are you having a good time? And I said, yeah, yeah, I am. He goes, isn't Peter Weir amazing? I said, yeah, Peter Weir's amazing. Is Robin Williams amazing? I said, yeah, Robin Williams is amazing. Yeah, he was great. And, and he goes, yeah, this will probably never happen to you again, you know. <laughs> and he, goes, he goes, I'm, you know, I think at the time he was like 82 or something. He said, you know, I'm 82, and uh, chances to work with Orson Welles don't come along very often. And I now, I, hard, I really think about everything that I learned from Orson and from Joe Cotton and the people that I was working with then. And I mine my memory for everything that was valuable about that experience. And I just don't want you to spend the whole time kicking that boy's feet. You know? Wow. <laughs> and you know, he was right, you know? It was an incredible, incredible experience. And I, I, I hope someday um, to get to tell him that. And I, I often think about that. He's still alive. I know, I, he's I, with I, I us. have he's, to get his number. I think he's about, I have his address, actually. Yeah, well, you know. He, I was very lucky. My husband and I were invited by Norman Lloyd to his home in the year 2000. And he showed us on his wall the memorabilia from Hitchcock, from Jean Renoir, from Orson Welles. Is he 100 he, now? I believe so. Yeah. He's a serious guy. I, he, just, I, he just stopped playing tennis the other day, I heard, you know, to, you know. Well, then maybe this helps us come back to Chet Baker, to these geniuses and legends. and Because really, what I want to know, because you're very persuasive playing that trumpet, is did you learn to play trumpet either now or when Richard Linklater first came up with the idea? You know, how much of the actual training musically did you have to do? Is Seymour Bernstein here tonight? Seymour, are you here? Yep. Seymour is my friend who... Uh, I made a documentary about a couple of years, a year or so ago. And um, it, was, it was the most uh, wonderful thing to edit this documentary and talk and think about music with Seymour. It was very much a musician's relationship to their art was very much on my mind when the script showed up at my door. And I saw the whole experience through the eyes of what I'd been learning from Seymour. And so I, I begged the director if we could put off the filming for a year, because I thought if I had a year to have trumpet lessons, I could really do something special. 
And, you know, the trouble with making movies is that the money's coming, and if, you know, getting the money to make, get a movie finance is very hard, and if it was on a different fiscal year, it would have to be re-put together, and the guy said, I really can't do that. And, and then I, I went to have a trumpet lesson, the trumpet teacher said, listen, man, you could have about eight to 10 years, and you would be nowhere near uh, um, with the way Chet Baker plays. And that gave me kind of permission. I watched Denzel Washington and Mo Better Blues. I watched some other things, and I realized that it's, it's doable, and that what I most wanted to convey was the relationship to the music. People who are expert trumpet players won't be fooled. I, 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 I learned about five or six songs uh, I tried to play them. Carmen Ijogo, my co-star, says the worst thing about this movie was that we had dressing rooms right next to each other and our hotel rooms were right next to each other. So she listened to me practice in between breaks and she listened to me practice when we went home. And it, you, I mean, you think you like the song Summertime, but listen to me play it for a couple months. And... But so the idea was what the director would do is he would crank up the music because the problem is it's hard to respond, not to respond if you play a wrong note. Um, but he would crank up the music, and I would just play along to it so that the embouchure would be right, but it's not me playing. And some of my playing was better than others, and, um, uh, but I tried, I consoled myself with the idea that I was mostly trying to convey a relationship to music and that the great music already exists. I don't have to invent that. That comes through, but I was aware especially watching the film the second time. It would have been one thing to just learn how to play the trumpet to incarnate somebody who played it beautifully. But this is a man who first was playing the trumpet with one tooth missing, mm -hmm. and then was playing the trumpet with those dentures. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, how did you modulate that? Because like, I felt the sort of difference in your mouth, but I wasn't sure well, how much that, that was. That, that part is so interesting to me about how our insecurities can be strengths. And I knew this from the film I was doing. In Linkletter's film, um, at, there was some scenes where Chet was rehearsing, and, 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 and I had really wanted to put this in, which was that Chet always wanted to sing in real jazz guys, you know, Jerry Mulligan and Art Pepper and um, Dizzy and uh, certainly Miles, but anybody, um, Charlie Parker would be like, why, why are you singing? Like, you know, I mean, you're not a singer. And A, he really liked to sing, he enjoyed it, but he was really worried about his embouchure and even missing the one tooth. Um, his mouth would get extremely tired, particularly if he was playing at a high level improv doing really good work, his mouth would get really, really tired. And the singing would give him a break, even as a young man. And so I, I find it really interesting. And of course, the reviews for his singing were absolutely dismal, terrible. And he was wildly made fun of it. And they still sell, proving once again that so often what's happening in the moment, we don't get. You know, there's something very real about his relationship to singing. And he sings, I had to take these singing lessons, right? Because I had to sing these songs. And one of the things you realize, I, I thought I agreed to do it because I didn't think that Chet was that good of a singer, that I, I believed, I liked his songs. It's not that, but it's not Billie Holiday. It's not Ella Fitzgerald. She, he, I thought I could convey what, what is beautiful about his singing. A one great critic said, it's not a person singing, it's the memory of someone singing. And you have this feeling when you listen to him sing like he might stop any second. Like, it, 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 it's, he plays it exactly, he sings it exactly the way he plays it. You can hear him sing, uh, it's just the note. It's, you hear it and, and there's nothing on it besides like pressing the vowels. And it, it's, I found it really beautiful until you try to do it. And then you realize, it, like Matisse or something, it's really hard to be that simple. It's really hard. And his, the guy can hold his breath for eternity, seemingly. He never breathes when he sings. It's so beautiful. And it's so empty that it becomes full. Hmm. I mean, it's, you can put anything you want into his emptiness. 
And, um, and mysteriously, people would see, get these terrible reviews about singing. And people would say, why do you keep doing that? And he would be, because I love it. And, and it was a combination of loving it and knowing his embouchure was weak. And, but it, I, I just think that's why it's so special. He, he withstood something for it, you know. And did you actually watch a lot of, besides Let's Get Lost, concert footage of him, oh, the yeah. way that he performed? Because there, there were quite a few. Oh, yeah. And it's so, we live in a wonderful time for that. You know, you can, you can go down the rabbit hole. I mean, it, it was so hard to sleep while I was shooting this because you can, you know, you go on YouTube and you can watch performances on Wednesday in Norway in 1977. Then, <laughs> then there's Thursday night show. And, um, you know, it's just, it's all there. And it's, it was... Uh, it was so interesting, and I got to speak with some people who played with him, and I found that really interesting, particularly this saxophonist, Bob Mover, was extremely helpful. Wow. And if I understand correctly, the director of this movie, Robert Boudreau, had made a short film mm -hmm. called The Deaths of Chet Baker, mm -hmm. in which um, Baker was played by Stephen McHattie, who in this plays film- Plays my father in this Plays film. your father. Yeah. Um, did you watch that? Did that give you the sense of confidence in Boudreau? I did watch it, and it did give me a sense of confidence in him. Um, but, you know, I've been acting in movies since I was 13. And it's a little strange, but y you kind of start to know what somebody's about by meeting them. Right. If you spend your whole life on a film set, I could kind of gauge how he talked about movies and how he, you know, his whole energy... Uh, and of course the call, you know, the way the script was coming together, uh, I felt confident that he had a good film in him. I've come to a lot. You know, you don't get to keep working if you don't take chances. I mean, unless you're, you know, Warren Beatty or something and you sit around and you hand pick which genius you're gonna work with next. You know, which is obviously the ideal way to work. I would like to work that way. Mm, not Spielberg, no. Uh, you know, I mean, like, that would be wonderful. But if you want to keep working and keep pushing yourself, you have to work with young people, and you have to work with people who, um, who are learning. Uh, and so you take risks on people. You sure. bet on them. No, and, and I would assume that reading the script, because it's this, I mentioned when we, when I introduced the film, it's not a typical biopic. You know, a lot of it is fictionalized. Maybe we'll talk about that in a second. But the structure of it, mm -hmm. the constant interweaving of the black and white footage, mm -hmm. which, yes, we know that it's the film that was being made. It's not the memory. It's the memory of making the film exactly. that was the memory, which I found the whole... I, I think that's what got me on the hook, is reading a script where it starts, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to play Chet Baker playing himself. That was very interesting. And it immediately undercuts the negative thing, I think, about biopics, which is the idea that it's factually accurate. I mean, uh, first of all, just because something's factually accurate doesn't make it entertaining. And uh, second of all, um, if you want to learn about Chet, you really can. All the information is out there. We have to use his story and his legacy and his mythos to hopefully tell a story that gets at something larger than just this happened on Wednesday and that happened on Friday kind of kind of thing. Well, in Let's Get Lost, I remember one of the details, Chet Baker did act in films. He played oh. a trumpet mm -hmm. in films. But Several to, films. But to the best of my knowledge, he never actually played himself. No, he never played himself. The, the movie imagines, he had been acting in some movies, then he screwed up his whole life. He was in jail in Italy, and Dino De Laurentiis, who was a big shot at the time, um, uh, came to him and said, I want to make a movie about your life, and I want you to be in it. And uh, a little bit like Eminem did Eight Mile, or Elvis did some versions of this. It's, it wasn't unheard of. So we'll do a real jazz movie. You can play yourself, and you can play the music, and it'll be the story of your recovery. And Chef's like, yeah, man, great. And um, <laughs> little did it, you know, he, he you know, was sh shooting up every five minutes already. And the thing never happened um, uh, because Chet screwed it up before it got to filming. But I thought the director had a brilliant idea was to imagine that it had. And uh, 
because it really gets, I love that thing of when that opening sequence ends and he goes, it wasn't like this. This is so fake, you know. I, you know, if I was really shooting up, I'd be puke everywhere. You know, I mean, I thought that was really interesting. Because yeah. it gets at, look, this is not real life. We're using this as to tell you a story that might be interesting about the life of an artist. Shit. I'm... It's because I talked about shooting up. No. <laughs> that's, that's Trump's America, you know. <laughs> 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 I'm going to assume that we don't have to worry about that sound. It's soundtrack. been great, everybody. Um, so I'm just going to keep going until somebody tells me that I have to stop. Uh, was there any thought of filming beyond 1967? Because obviously Chet Baker continued to have a life and a career. No, I, we wanted, we had one simple story to tell, and that was the idea that in life, you can have a personal, a giant personal failure that coexists simultaneously with a professional triumph. And that it's very, I like this about the movie, and it is actually a dangerous idea, but it, the idea is that everybody loves this thing of like, okay, I'm just gonna keep talking to you, but I, inside you should know I'm scared. Um, <laughs> Uh, they, they, they love this very simplistic idea that drugs are bad. Um, it's getting worse, right, guys? I mean, are we all... You'll give us the high sign if we should leave, right? <laughs> anyway... We're okay. I have okay. gotten word from backstage. Okay, we're fine. No problem. Continue. You might be in trouble, but we have a quick exit. So. <laughs> um, uh, no, um... I lost the two great influences of my life as an actor, who were my peers, who I would say are both actors and artists. And not, you can't say that about all of them. And, and that these River Phoenix and Philip Seymour Hoffman were two actors that I worked with very intensely and was really inspired by. Um, I would have never told him this when he was alive, because you know when you're friends with somebody, but I had a picture of Phil over my desk as inspiration about like what decisions to make because like, what, what would Phil say about this? I would never have told him that. Because he would have, <laughs> what are you, an idiot? Uh, <laughs> don't do what I do. But I really admired him. And, and River, you know, I didn't, he was my first scene partner. We learned about acting together, you know. And they both died of heroin. Um, and, you know, these things, are drugs bad? Yes, they're terrible. They destroy lives. But they are, most of the time, they are not, the problem, the problem is the, they're the band-aid, they're the, what's the right way to say this? There's a deeper source of pain. They're painkillers. Drugs and alcohol are painkillers. And how we manage our pain, depression, loneliness, uh, fear, anxiety, all these real things that live in, they're real. And that's why our friends and our brothers and sisters and people die of drugs and alcohol. Or they give their lives over to it. Even if they don't physically die, they're ruled by it. And so it's a real thing. It's not just like, oh, insert bad music, the drugs are coming out, he went to the dark side. And we really wanted to make a movie that addresses, like, how could somebody, because you can read stories about friends of Chet's in the period of his life when after this accident he was on methadone. He was, they're very, very touching. They're very touching. And how does that guy become this ghost of a person in Let's Get Lost? I mean, it's really just a shadow figure. It's an amazing story. If you don't have it, Chet Baker, live in Tokyo, is his last performance. And Branford Marsalis, like, who hated, I think I'm getting this story right, but I know, I know Branford hated Chet's music and thought he was totally overrated and everything. And, and Chet said, well, if I could play like Branford Marsalis, I wouldn't. Um, and, um, <laughs> but Branford Marsalis and, like, even said, this live in Tokyo, um, is the real thing. This is an amazing jazz artist. And it is, I, I played it constantly. Every morning when I was getting dressed, I'd play this concert footage because it's, it's, it's just so beautiful. He sings Elvis Costello's Almost Blue. And if you want, it's, it's one track. Just get that song. It's so beautiful. But so there's a story by the, it's the drummer, the bassist, and the liner notes of this thing says that they were sitting in the 
hallway in Tokyo before this performance, shooting up, right? And the fellow musician says to him, don't you ever get sick of it? Chet, don't you ever just get sick of it? I mean, it's airport, score, drugs, play, airport, score, drugs, play. Don't you ever get sick of it? And Chet looked at him and said, yeah, but if we don't play, we'll never get the drugs. <sighs> And it's brutal. It's funny, but it's brutal because it sees, it shows you where it's, it, it's come to. Hmm. You, you know, the drugs start to help you play, and then they're, they're everything. And, and then you're a shadow person. You know, you're a zombie. You're, a, you're a, you know. And so it's just like, how did that happen? And how it happens in what is perceived as a triumph. Show up at Birdland, kick ass. You're gone, you know? And... That's the, the idea is like, what is the music in service of? And that's the larger question that I'm, is the point to play music beautifully or is the point to play music beautifully in service of something other than your own? Because if it's for your own, you might as well do whatever you can to play well, you, you know? But if it's for something larger, then, you know, then, then the questions become deeper and more interesting. But I love the ending of the movie because it, it, it gets at that, at that moment that I've, that I've seen with people where the world is going, yay, and, and inside, you know, they're dying. You know? And um, I certainly saw that with my two friends. Hmm. Wow. Um, I really want to ask you a question about another film because as this audience knows, Good Kill it was one of my favorite films last year and it was, ridiculously overlooked, underrated. And I wanted to ask you about that because it's about a particular kind of dangerous surveillance. In other words, when it becomes um, drone warfare and remote control murder. If you could tell us a little about what drew you to this. I know you had worked with Andrew Nichol before. In fact, we had you here with Gattaca many mm -hmm. years ago. It's the first time I was here, right? Yeah. Um, no, you. Uh, yes, it was the first time that you were here. and. I don't know of any other director besides Kubrick, who's no longer with us, who is as deft at exploring the fine line between the human and the mechanical. In other words, when do human beings act mechanically and when do machines seem to leak human actions? It's attributes? so beautifully poetic that you're saying this while the alarm is going off. It's like, <laughs> it's like the meta and the, it's really, it's the, the Andrew, Andrew has this brilliant notion. He made this movie, Gattaca, Lord of War, and Good Kill. And he really can speak about where our soul intersects with our development, you know, where, how we define progress. What is, the first movie was gene, about genetic engineering and, you know, what happens if you get rid of all the dyslexics in the world? <laughs> you know? What happens if you get rid of them all? What happens if you get rid of, every, you know, we're talking about, I, I, Shakespeare was onto this, through our deficiencies become our strengths, you know. Chet had a bad embouchure, so he, he sang beautifully, you know. Bob Fosse had his crooked legs, and so he developed the instep, you know. I mean, it's, it's how we all respond to life, right? And it's so beautiful. And, and Andrew is a great, great filmmaker. And this movie, it was hard. It's the only movie I've ever done where whole um, movie theater chains refused to show it because it, it, it was a friendless movie because it's extremely critical of the military, which, of course, the right wing hates. And it's extremely critical of the Obama administration. So the left didn't really want to champion this movie. It had no friends. I mean, it really, um, it, and it, yet it, there's a, completely, I mean, my, sadly, I really believe that 15, 20 years from now, people will be asking me about this movie a lot more. Um, the, the people who did like it were, are very interesting people. And, but it's, it's, Andrew called the movie a desert rose. It's definitely beautiful. It's definitely worth looking at, but nobody wants to touch it because it's covered in thorns. And um, it's just a lot about it hurts. It's a little bit like, you know, sometimes when you do research on something, I remember this, it's, it's just a touchy conversation. I remember Wally Shawn once saying to me, I don't want to know any more about animal rights, activists, and stuff like that, because I know as soon as I know all that, I'm going to have to be a vegetarian, and I don't want to be. 
and, and I'm too old and I can't, I just, I just, I have enough, the, you know, battlefields I'm fighting on. I don't think I can handle that one. And yeah, I, I say that way. I mean, he's so touching and serious. And, and, and it's a lot of people feel that way about the drone strikes. It's like, well, we're out of Afghanistan. And so, I mean, Andrew likes to say this thing that there's only, what well, we have to be really aware of, there's a really new powerful weapon in the world. And it's very powerful. And the only thing that's ever stopped wars in the past is you either win the war, it's either too expensive, or the people, populace gets upset because of the body bags coming home. Well, the interesting things about the drone strikes is it's cheap, right? Um, you'll never win the war because you're not even there. And, um, uh, and what was the other one I said? Uh, anyway, the, the, uh, oh, what's that? And body bags don't come home. They stay there, you know? And so nothing, so what you're creating is a situation for a kind of brave new world, uh, continual war, which let's face it, we're, we've been at war for a long time now, you, you know? And what's this, uh, we've been at troops in Afghanistan for like 13, 14 years now. And it's, um, so this perpetual war is happening and the drones are making it happening. And my, I have a brother who's in the special forces uh, in the United States Army, and he says this, it's a really great thing, he says the drones are a little bit like sitting on your front porch and with a 22 and shooting off all the heads of the dandelions and thinking you've de-weeded your garden. You, it looks good right now, but you, it's all coming back more so. You, you know, and so the only way to truly de-weed your garden is to get down and go there and take the, the, the weeds out or let them grow, you know, but you can't Anyway, yeah. that's, I've no, spoken. I, I, and and, and I, just, I hope that this is going to encourage, because the film is now available on DVD. I remember we watched it, and my husband Mark said it presents war as a video game. Mm. And that's one of the most chilling aspects. And I think it just, it, it, more so than watching anything on the nightly news, Good Kill made me truly feel and think about what it must be like for the people who are doing the actual drone work here. It's, it's your character is, is mm. tormented. But um, let me also move to one more, another aspect of your work. We, we don't have that much time. I'll ask one more question and then take two or three from the audience. Um, Maggie's Plan is coming out soon. This is Rebecca Miller's comedy with you and Greta Gerwig and Julianne Moore. And it made me realize once again how you are so strong when you're playing weak men. In other words, the, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I jotted down boyhood, 10,000 saints, Maggie's plan. Characters who seem to have little anchor. And I, I'm wondering, are you drawn to that sort of character? Is it? Well, you know, there's this idea that who exactly among us is not weak? Do you, you know, and if you really tell the truth about a person, there are weaknesses. And I think all those characters that you mentioned also have great beauty, oh, yeah. you know? And, and so they're more interesting to me. I find if you're trying to put a three-dimensional human being on screen, somebody that you can smell, somebody that you feel like you would know them if you met them, you know, a, a person you can, that feels true, there has to be some weakness. And I find weakness really funny. You know, I, 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 it's why, I like, those Chekhov things are all called com comedies. You know, I really do find it so funny. I, there's things, I'll sit and watch the Chet Baker movie and just laugh. I, I just, I find, uh, I find people so funny the way that they avoid pain and um, think they can control situations that are uncontrollable. And, uh, or maybe I'm just a really weak person and I'm well no, cast. No. I, 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 I think it's not that, in other words, I think it takes a very strong actor to play weak well. well um, just like it takes a very smart actor to play dumb well. I, I hope so. so you know. I, I hope so. Warren Beatty always played the best dumb guys, and you know he's really smart. But I will tell you one funny Before the Devil Knows Your Dead story, since a little bit about Phil Seymour Hoffman, is we were rehearsing this, this uh, movie, and I, I was just like, I'm so struggling with this character. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. And, and Phil says, you want me to tell you what your problem is? I'm like, oh, God. Okay, what's my problem? Problem is that you like to be alpha. 
And this character is beta. And I'm alpha. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but he was also right. You know, learning, you know, human beings, we like pack animals. We have power structures and, you know, and um, where you fit in that. At that in that given scenario is very interesting to me, and um, so now you know. And also, I think you you allow female actors to really shine with you around you. So. Whether it's Julie Delpy in the before films, whether it's Patricia Arquette in Boyhood, and you'll see in Maggie's Plan such magnificent, um, fresh interactions with both Good. Greta Gerwig and Julianne Moore. We have time for just a few quick questions. Raise the lights, because I promised we would get you out by 10.50. Gentleman in the middle, yes? Yeah, I have a question about what is it, how do you approach a project like that when there's such a strong... How do you approach a project like Boyhood knowing that there's going to be such a commitment over so many years? It's easy. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 with somebody like Linkletter, you know that he thinks outside the box about what's possible. Um, and so it's really exciting. I, I thought I was being offered a job that no actor had been offered before, which is to really create a character using time as clay. Time was the clay. So I didn't, you know, if I had to do my, like in a normal movie, I would have to do the, I could, might have had to do the first scene last, right? That happens all the time. And if I did the first scene of Boyhood last, I think I probably would have put on like a fat suit and walked with a cane and, you, you, you know, I would have, my imagination of how I was going to be different after 12 years, you know, and, and Rick gave me this opportunity where I didn't have to act any of that. That was just going to happen. And so, the, so what I could do is I had this vision in my head of what my father looked like when I was six, my first memory of when that boy starts, and what he looked like at my high school graduation. And they were so different in my life. You know, my, my father, I was, it was 19 when I was born. So when I was six, he was 25, you know. And, um, and when I graduated, he was a grown man. And I saw, I was like, oh, wow, you've been growing up too. And, I, I, and so that was my model, to try to create and try to get at these ideas of, you know, how to, how to manifest, you know, because kids don't think about their parents that way. They just take them at face value. They don't think about their life. But I had to make up, like, what's, what's happening in him? How is he changing? Wow. So. Great. Uh, yes, all the way in the corner, right by the wall. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between good acting, great acting, and kind of the pinnacle of acting? <laughs> Can you talk wow. a bit about the difference between good acting, great well, acting, and the pinnacle? Well, I only know about the pinnacle. <laughs> my, my joke about this, the joke I love to tell is people say, oh, you know, um, Daniel Day-Lewis is so great in um, Lincoln, you know, or something. And I go, look, Steven Spielberg's directing. Tony Kushner wrote, you got the world's best cinematographer. You got the world's best craft service guy, okay? <laughs> I mean, if you can't be damn good in that, then you suck, all right? <laughs> What's hard is being really good on an episode of Law & Order when you're the guest star and they give you some, <laughs> that's hard, you know? I mean, uh, and, and so I have been, moments of grace are what, what I imagine you mean at the pinnacle, and we're all chasing that. I, I feel I've subscribed to the theory that the only way I can figure out how to be great is to be good over and over and over and over and over again, like, and then it might amount to something. Um, I'm wildly envious, you know, like people like Chet who, who can, you know, just, you have the appearance, but even Chet, you know, the guy practiced, all he cared about was the trumpet. He practiced nonstop. He did his whole life to it. So it's a little misleading. I, I think um, for me, the difference in my own work is usually who I'm working with. You know, good people bring out the best in you. And, you know, when you're working on less good material, it's very, very difficult to be okay even. Um, and so that's one of the things that makes it really hard for actors because they're, we're only as good as our opportunities um, and why it becomes so important, I think, for actors um, to even, actors anywhere to work on, on the great writing, to work on, you know, when you're doing 
Shakespeare and Moliere and Chekhov, and if you're doing the really hard stuff, it makes doing a Snickers ad really easy. <laughs> Which invariably you have to do, you know? So. Okay. And there's a gentleman right here. How, being an actor and being an author, how do those two things work together for you? You know, um, I, uh, the great joy of acting has to do with being creative in a collective. That, um, that it's, a, it's a quilt, that movie. The music, the lighting. I'm only as good, you know, the DP blows a moment. It stinks, uh, you know, how the editor, I wish, you know, a lot of the movies I've worked on, I'd kill to edit them. <laughs> like how they cut that, why do they, you know, they leave this stupid scene in, but, but you just live it with the joys and downsides of working with others. And for me, having ownership of creativity and not having to collaborate with anybody is really wonderful too. And that's where, why I come at writing. I come at it as an actor. I like, I always view my writing like a controlled improv. You know, I just, I kind of hear a character's voice and I riff on it, and I riff on it, I riff on it, and then I rewrite. Um, that's my relationship. Is that what you meant by the question? Yeah. That's my relationship. It's a break and it's a way to have some ownership. You know? Actually, we haven't even had time to acknowledge the multifaceted career of this gentleman. We haven't even talked about his acting on stage, his directing on stage, the books that he has written. Um, we, I, 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 and at the films you've directed, I mean, we would need a whole other evening of real pieces. Of which I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and since it is kind of late, and if I ask one more question, it's going to lead to at least four more. Oh, I'll talk for two. Let's I'm just going to say how much I appreciate. This is the third time that I've had the good fortune to be next to Ethan Hawke on this stage. You are such a good friend to Real Pieces, to the 92nd Street Y. We look forward, given how much beautiful work you do, to the next time. Thank you, Thank guys. You.